Hey, would you help me say thank you to our worship team again and to our prayer team, our hospitality people. Boy, are we grateful. Boy, am I so thankful. I, I want to say in particular an expression of gratitude to the people who come every week and, and offer to pray with us and meet with us right in the middle of our service. We do that on, on purpose. It is the centerpiece of our service is to bring our lives before the Lord in prayer. And I'm so grateful that uh, whether or not you have the opportunity to pray with someone, that you still have op- the, they, they still take the opportunity to share an encouraging word. They, these are, it is good for our hearts to be nourished by grace. All right, well, let me, as we begin, let me say a couple of things. First of all, to every one of you, grace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Grace to you. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the last few weeks, we had a series was, that was, uh, I called the, the Voice of the Elders, and I asked some, uh, some people, some, those who had been in, in ministry for many years and were part of this house, to come and speak to us and, and to share their heart. Their, what, I asked them to answer this question, what is your hope for the church? Fairly open-ended and yet some degree of focus. What is your hope for the church? Well, uh, because we're, we're, summer's still ending and we've got a couple of things to do, we're going to continue this series uh, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm. The, the, the now the series is called Voice of the Church Boys. Uh, that's just uh, some church. That's just some church boys who have been in church for a few minutes, and I've still asked them to share their heart for the church. So uh, I'll, I'm. I'm. I'm going to speak today. So that'll be good, right? I mean, I'm. I'm ready for that. And then next week, next week, Pastor Jay Carson will speak. Yeah. That's about what happened on Saturday as well. And then in a, in a, f- a few weeks after that, uh, I'm going to have, uh, uh, he, I don't know where he went, there he, he's over here somewhere, uh, our associate pastor and superintendent of the project here, uh, Pastor Mike McCollum, will, will speak. That'll be great. So the church boys, us, us church boys will have some things to say. We're still going to be answering the question, what is your hope for the church? One of the reasons uh, why we're doing that is because it's good, but... Uh, a number of months ago, many months ago, a couple of things came up, and Mrs. Dav and I have been invited to uh, to speak at a couple of uh, of, of conferences. Uh, she she actually spoke yesterday morning at one in Portland. I know, but um, uh, amazing. Uh, they didn't ask me to because it was anyway. Um, they said we've heard what you said, and we're you. <laughs> uh, but it was tigers. It was all right. Anyway, anyway, all right. Uh, but uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna speak at a. Uh, the first thing is a. The first one's youth is it's youth and parents. Or we're speaking at a church that wants basically it's a family renewal conference. So be praying for us and also praying because Mrs. Dad will be staying in a yurt. Exactly. So, um, so anyway, there's that. And then after that, we're, we're gonna do a, a, a marriage renewal in a, a, a few weeks after that. And then, and then, uh, I don't mind telling you this, and because he won't hear this, he won't know. But and then, uh, the we're, we're, we're going to go. I'm going to go to Oklahoma, and I'm going to. They call it preaching an installation service. That means where you are the person who presides over and preaches over the installation of a new pastor, a lead pastor at a church. And I'm happy to tell you that our Jordan Dunn has been elected to be a lead pastor of his church in Oklahoma. Yeah. And he said, and he said, I don't think it's too much to ask, but would you come? He's got pastors and superintendents and everything, but I said, well, good luck stopping me. I mean, we were, we were going to come anyway, but now I get to say stuff. So I think that's all I was going to say, right, babe? Or, oh, well, oh, and what, here's the fun part. <laughs> the people that have asked us to come to these conferences have specifically said, we want you both. So Mrs. Dev said, well, what, what am I going to say? I said, we're just not, we, I said we'll, bear, we'll prepare. Don't worry. We'll prepare. But basically, after we prepare, we're just going to be team to have live for 45 minutes. So kind of what you just saw. So <laughs> who knows? So especially, I get nervous when it comes to the marriage renewal part because then it's, anyway, here we go. I shouldn't even tell. Things are coming to my mind. We anyway, we hosted this thing called Rendezvous one time, and they had a bunch of guest speakers, but they were boring. I should state it in my script, but they were. They were super boring. And so when we were hosting it, so she just started saying things, and then it got exciting. All right. (laughs) The question is. What is your hope for the church? Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking, Luke writing, Acts 20, 32. And now, I'm reading from the Berean Standard. 
And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. My hope for the church, for this church, is the grace of God. Here's the background of this text in Acts chapter 20. Luke is recording, this is toward the last portion of Paul's ministry. It's his final tour, his last missionary, sort of last missionary trip, unless you want to count traveling to Rome. Uh, That was less being sent and more being... But he is saying farewell here to the Ephesian, the the leaders of the Ephesian church. Those leaders have come to him where he is, and he has been meeting with them and talking with them. Now, Paul had spent, the, of all the places where he stayed over time, other than perhaps Antioch, he, uh, he, sp- he spent a, a great deal of time in Ephesus. The better part of three years he spent there ministering to those people. So the, the, his relationship with them would have been deep and wide. And he would have, this would have been a very uh, a strong relational connection with them. And we know from the passage, either before this or after this, as we read it, Paul actually tells them that he knows that this is going to be the last time he will see their faces. They both know, he and them, that the Holy Spirit has been talking to them and warning them, and yet he feels compelled by the Spirit. He knows he's going to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to face arrest and challenge. They know it. It's very, uh, it's, it's filled with tender and intense emotion. And these are the words that he says to them. This is how he feels about them. So on one hand, we get to hear, we get the privilege of, we get to get the the privilege of hearing how Paul feels. And that by itself is important. How does he feel about the church? What is his conviction? What is his hope? His confidence for that church is the grace of God. But also, the fact that he is telling them this is he wants them to know that this is his confidence. He wants them to be aware that his singular confidence for them is the grace of God. He wants them not only to know that, but so that they will share in that confidence. He's committing them to the grace of God. He wants them to hear it so that they will also commit themselves to the grace of God. The grace of God, the good will of God toward you. His grace is not defined by financial institutions. It's not two weeks of permission and then finally a penalty. It's not permission. It's power. It's, his, it's, it's the prevailing influence of his goodwill in your life. It's his will that you be saved. It's grace that saves you. It's grace that moves into your life. It's his will that you mature. That's a work of grace. It's, a, it's his will that you serve and encourage others. That's grace at work. It is the prevailing good will of God in your life that is revealed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ and made widely and completely available to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is this grace that is communicated to us by the direct divine influence of the Holy Spirit. In Scripture, it is impossible to differentiate between the idea of God's grace and its work in our life and the work of the Holy Spirit. They are one and the same. He is the Spirit of grace. Grace at work is the Spirit of God at work in our life. Paul's entire confidence for this church, he commits them to to the grace of God. He wants them to commit themselves to the grace of God. And, And furthermore, Luke is writing this for every reader to also that we, in turn, might share or hope to share in Paul's confidence and join Paul in a mutual commitment of ourselves to the grace of God. And this is my hope 
for my life and for my family. My God, it's my hope for my family. It's the thing that I say every day. The grace of God is on my family. The grace of God is, and I, and I say their names and I talk about them and I give thanks to God that in his grace, I entrust my family, I entrust my heart and my home to the prevailing goodwill of God that is revealed to us and made available to me through the Lord Jesus Christ and communicated directly to my life by his Holy Spirit. It's my hope for my home. It's my hope for this house. I commit myself and this church to the grace of God, and I pray that you will join me in committing yourselves to his grace. He says, I commit you to the grace of God, the, to God and the word of his grace. He does not separate these commitments. These are not two different commitments, but the word of grace from God. To commit ourselves to the grace of God or to the word of his grace is to commit ourselves to God himself. Paul is committing them to God and to the word of God's grace specifically. It's just to God and specifically to the word of his grace. He says, I commit you. Somebody said commit. Commit. I commit you. I set, he said, look, here's the idea. I am taking you and setting you before the grace of God. I am entrusting you to grace. Another another idea of saying, literally, he is depositing them into the grace of God. There is no other way. There is no other place. There is no other hope or help but the grace of God. And the grace of God is more than enough. It's more than enough. We've already heard Paul tell us that the, his grace is sufficient. Yes. And sufficient doesn't mean adequate. It doesn't mean a C. It means sufficient means there is no place where there is any lack. The grace of God is fully sufficient. There is no lack, no weakness. There is nothing, no place, no area in our life where the grace of God is not present and more than enough. Even in our weakness, his grace abounds. There isn't anything that we desire that there isn't a grace for. There isn't anything that we're going to face as a church that there isn't a grace for. There isn't anything that you can dream of or desire that there is not a grace for that. We are committed to his grace. Paul calls it the word of his grace. Word, logos, means message or teaching or an idea expressed in words. And, And we get that. But to the Greeks... And these Ephesians would have been more Greek than Hebrew. Logos carried with it an inherent idea. Their frame of reference to the idea of Logos was Logos was a word that referred to the governing power of the universe. Logos was the wisdom that guided existence. Logos was the, the power that held everything together in their philosophy. So, in kind, we can say that Paul is, to their hearing, he is committing the Ephesians to the governing power of God's grace. He is committing them to the prevailing influence of grace and to the word, the instruction of grace. Grace is not a feeling. Grace is not just a vibe. It is the good will of God toward us and its effect upon us and its continuing influence in our lives. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul talks about how grace happens to us and then keeps happening. Happens and then keeps happening. He says, for the grace of God has appeared. Now, ultimately, he means in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has a re- a revealed and availed grace. I'm gonna, I'm, it is my hope that I, that I say all those things enough that you'll be able to just articulate them on their own, that the grace of God is fully revealed and availed to us in Jesus Christ. He said the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Grace happens to you. Grace happens to you. Yeah. 
So it saves me. It's an event. It comes outside of me. It takes, it's, I am saved by not my, by, by my own effort or my own striving, but it has come to me. It is a power that brings change in my life. And bringing salvation and that same grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, and teaching us, instructing us, advising us, leading us, influencing us to reject, to say no to ungodliness. The, this is the, the continuing influence of the Holy Spirit, of the grace of God in our life. And teaching us to live godly, self-controlled, and upright lives in this present age. The word of His grace. Grace affects then our character and our conduct just as much as it does our conversion. Let us commit ourselves to His grace. I commit you to, to the word of His grace, Paul says, which can build you up. Somebody say, build us up. Yeah. Which can. The, the, the Berean just says, which can. And that's fine, it's accurate. But can is really the word, it's the, it's the derivative of the word dunamis. It means this. Your rival might say, which is able to. It, it, the most literal wooden is, I commit you to the word of his grace, which has power to build you up. Grace has power. Listen, you've got to renew your minds when you start talking about grace. You're not talking about little feathers from heaven, not delicate crystal vases. We're talking about the power of God. The most powerful thing in the universe is the grace of God at work. And that grace has power to do something in your life. Grace is God's power at work in you. And grace has an agenda. Grace has an agenda in your life. Grace has come to work in your life to make you more than you were before. He wants to build you up, to, edi to build us, to edify, to strengthen. Grace is at work to build you, to complete you, to strengthen you, to sweeten you. My God, some of us, hallelujah, still working on our resting grace face, right? Right? <laughs> sweeten you, to free you, to build you. This is the hope for the church. Grace has an agenda. And if you'll slow your feet and soften your heart, you can be sensitive to his agenda. Yeah. It's not your agenda. We're not, we're not authorizing people to say, well, I got, I got me an agenda. No, we're going to soften our heart to the, to the impulses of love. Grace has an agenda. It is, it, 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 in every moment, this has been a consistent prayer of mine for the last number of weeks. Lord, grant me a greater awareness. Help me to be sensitive and just to cooperate with the agenda of grace. And you know what I find? I find that I'm, it's not about me striving or conjuring up at all. It's not about me conjuring up. You, you can't conjure up the agenda of grace. Because it's his. He already has it. You follow it. You can't beat a river into submission, but you can yield to its current. You, you, you just follow the impulse of love. Keep your heart soft, your feet slow. Let me just give you one quick example about the agenda of grace. We, well, during our, we had a little staycation, and what, one of the things I wanted to do was take my wife and daughter and the boys, of course, to the beach so that they could rest. I wanted to just get them in a hotel at the beach so they could sleep. And uh, so we do that, but my wife cannot uh, go to the beach without also riding the tilt-a-whirl. She has a fundamental addiction to it. I rode on it once, uh, the first of our marriage together, and now I just watch. Look, I like me some rides. I'll go on any ride, but not that crazy thing from hell. No, that, that's the nauseating thing from... But you, you haven't lived. I'll tell you this right now. You haven't lived till you just sit and watch her by herself. By herself in a tilt-a-whirl cart. Clapping and laughing, it's the best. It brings joy to me so much. She loves it, laughs so hard. Everybody else is screaming, and she's just laughing. It's like a worship experience. So anyway, we leave Gearheart, we're going to go down to Seaside, and we're going to, get, we're going to go on a tilt the world. But of course, like all the wise people, we have dinner first. Anyway, before you want to, anyway. Yeah, so no, this is not, that's not the whole point. So we, we go to the pizza place, we leave the pizza place, we're going to go to the tilt the world in just a minute. So we, after the pizza, we're going to stop in the men's room. This is all, I'm going to tell the story fast. So we go in, I've got me, I've got, the two, I've got the moose, I've got the ape, and I've got Bono. You know who Bono is? You'll find out later, okay? 
It's Emily's boyfriend. Okay, so uh, so we're all now we're all we're gonna go in there. We're gonna take a quick 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 pit stop before we head over to the thing, and uh, we, end, we we go into the men's room and it's kind of crowded and we've got this young there's this young guy that looks like Gollum. He's acting like Gollum from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, he's leaning against and I'm thinking, what is wrong with this guy? He's leaning against the wall like a, a, afraid of all of us. Like Ugh. you know, like it <laughs> it burns us. He's doing this. He's covering his face from us. I mean, this is weird. What's this kid up to? You know, it's you know it's so I, I kind of get a little closer and I find out that he's feeling super sick and he doesn't want to be around us or and he's actually waiting for the stall to open you know where that you know why but the guy, whoever's in there is feeling comfortable and not moving and uh, <laughs> and uh, and so this kid is just trapped in the bathroom and he's really worried and so anyway he, he he just makes a break for the for the trash can and begins to have fellowship with it and of course People begin to immediately, you know, at, you know, leave that restroom faster than the Israelites out of Egypt, and <laughs> and they're they're leaving, you know, they're not packing their clothes, it's, they're not making, their, their, no bread is leavening, they're out, and uh, and so right there, so here's the deal. So normally, and I think my friend, I'm looking at my friend Jay Carson, and I think he'd be the first one out the door. He wants nothing to do with germs. He barely go in that bathroom anyway. Now with that hazmat, you know, uh, but so people are just leaving, and that's fine. That's all normal, right. except. You know, if you keep your feet slow and your heart soft, there's the, the gentle breeze of grace. Grace has an agenda. So I, before I beat feet out of that room, I said, hey, bud, are you okay? What's going on? And he started to talk about how he didn't feel good and how you just came on him and he's got to go to work, but he can't tell anybody. And I said, I just started talking to him a little bit. And, and I, I can do that. I mean, I've always sort of done it, but now it's easier because at this point in my life, like, I can be almost anybody's dad. But no matter what, it always comes across creepy, and I just don't know what to do about it. But anyway, <laughs> it's all I just have to disclose, like, I am creepy. But, you know, like, uh, but uh, so I'm just like, hey, buddy, you okay? I mean, he's trying to, you know, I'm talking to him, and, uh, and uh, you know, and I'm telling him, okay, listen, let's, somebody get your manager. Why don't you just get some water? Why don't you get out of here? Just go. Just, it's okay. No, but you're going to be fine. I'm trying to talk to him a little bit, encourage him. And then somebody else confirms, and then he makes his way. He gets out. He leaves. Wonderful. Now, you might think, well, isn't that wonderful? Well, I thought so. And so, whatever. So, we, I don't say anything else, and I, I do tell my boys to, I said, all right, take a bunch of deep breaths outside, flush those, you know, all that. And uh, so, we, we're, we head over to the Tilt-A-Whirl, and we're there, and Mrs. Dav's getting ready to get her joy on, and I'm standing there. I'm wearing everyone's, everyone's bag and purse and sunglasses. <laughs> Everything is on me. So, I'm standing there looking like a total dipstick, you know, like a big, huge tourist dad, you know, and... Uh, and I'm standing there, and, uh, and I see this manager walk around, and he looks nervous. And he keeps talking about he's looking for somebody. And I thought, mm, okay. So I said, you know, sir, I might be interrupting something, but I think I might be able to help you. I think I know who you're looking for. And he said, and it was the kid. And I said, well, here's what happened, and he's okay, and he was feeling sick. And he said, well, I was worried about him. So we kind of went back and forth. So he felt better. He was worried, didn't know where he was. I said, he went off. Somebody got him some water. He went home. Oh, good, because he thought maybe he was still wandering around. So we talked for a minute. Bit, and then you know, I thought, well, look at that. That must have been, there was my mission. Well, there you go. Thank you, Lord. And so I, I turn around. I'm walking, watching the tilt of the world, and this guy's still standing here. And he says, he says, do I know you? He's a manager of the Tilt World. And I said, nope. <laughs> I mean, he couldn't. I mean, here I am, you know, tourist dad of the year. And I said, he said, do I know you? I said, no, you don't. Now, I didn't even, normally, I'm in, if I'm in the mood, I'll say, well, have you seen Touching Just a Movie? You know, and I lead people on. But um, <laughs> um, it's a full-time job being me. But anyway, I just, I, you know, I, I didn't say anything. This time, the first time I said, you don't know, no, you don't, I don't, you don't know me. He said, you don't know, you don't know me. He looked at me, he goes, he said, are you a pastor? I said, I said, well, yeah, maybe you do know me. And then he said, and then he said, yeah, I've seen you on YouTube. <laughs> five, five dollar famous. Yeah. I've seen you on YouTube. And I said, oh, okay. And I thought, well, there it is. This must be the, this is what the Lord is doing. Keep listening. And then he says, yeah, you're at that church, you heard it's church, yeah. Yeah, and he said, we well, you know Bill Darlington was my school principal. Wow. Oh, yeah. I thought, well, now this is getting nuts. He's like, I knew he knows Melissa Darlington. Yeah, he says, my uncle was the pastor of Seaside Assembly of God. Oh. So now we get into this conversation, and this guy starts unpacking his life, and I think the Lord is having a renewal moment for this guy's whole spiritual journey while I'm donned in purses and sunglasses. <laughs> And my wife is going, -hoo 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 -hoo! <laughs> 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 
<laughs> That's all that's happening. <laughs> Do I know you? Anyway, how does that happen? Grace has an agenda. God has a loving, powerful agenda. And it may not, like Elijah, it may not be in the, in the great wind. It may not be in the fire or the earthquake. But if you'll listen to the voice of the Spirit, grace, if you'll follow the impulse of love, that, and that same grace has a specific agenda in your life. Every, it has a long-term and an immediate thing. Jesus said, I will build my church. This is his agenda, to build us, to increase us to strengthen us, to multiply his church, to mature his church. Paul said in, in, in Philippians 1, 6, he said, he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. He is at work in your life. Right. Psalms 127 tells us that unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. So we commit ourselves to the grace of God. Amen. This is true of you. It's true of your house. It's true of this house. It is by the grace of God and the power of His grace that we will become more than we have been. It is by His grace that we, this house, will become all that we have been called to be, all that we dream of. It is His grace at work. Won't He do it? Won't He do it? Somebody's going to help me this morning. Won't He do it? He will, by His grace. Let us commit ourselves to his grace. Finally, Paul says this, it will, that word of his grace will build you up and will give you an inheritance among those made holy. That's what to, it was, the sanctified is the passive past tense. You are being, those who have been made holy. Don't miss that last part. It is grace that makes us holy. Holiness happens to you. Holiness is conduct that is a result of contact. Grace has happened to us and it has an influence in our life. Grace does this. And grace will give us an inheritance. Grace will finish what it has, it has started in you. It started with the down payment. Paul said, when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. It was the down payment, the guarantee of our redemption. Grace has started in our life. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit. But, and no matter how wonderful that deposit is, and we have yet to discover all of the wonders that God has for us. How many know that there is a lot more than even what we're experiencing? If he said, let it be on earth as it is in heaven, that means heaven is our barometer. We have a lot more to believe for and to experience. But no matter how wonderful, no matter how glorious, no matter how abundant things are here, our full Hope, the real hope of our church, of our lives, is not here and now. It is then and there. Our great hope is in heaven. Therein is our full redemption, our great salvation. We are a people stamped with eternity. And grace will bring us there. It is grace that has brought us safe thus far. And grace will lead us home. Won't he do it? Yes. Won't he do it? Yes. Won't God do it? Yes. He will do it by his grace. Let us commit ourselves to the word of his grace, which is able to build us up and bring us, give us an inheritance among those whom he has made holy. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. and sing that again. Amazing grace.
bright shining as the sun. We know less day to sing His God's praise than when we it is, there's a grace for it. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. It covers me. I commit you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Lord, we commit ourselves and this house, our hearts and our homes to the grace of God. If you have an amen, would you share it with me? Amen. I'm going to ask Tossie just to keep playing a little bit. And if you'd like just to build an altar, just to create a space just to wait upon the Lord. The Bible says he gives grace to the humble. It's in, that, it's in that humble place of a contrite heart where God visits us with a special grace, where he represents himself, visits us. The Bible says he gives us more grace. So if you're feeling like, hey, I want to make just a moment, take a moment. You want to, where you are in your seat around here in the front, in no time at all, we'll have much more room for all of that. But if you need to go, may the Lord bless you. Grab your children. Have a wonderful Sunday. If you'd like to remain, Tashi's going to play here, and the front will be just for prayer, please. God bless you. Mm-hmm.